We're going to my e lecture on the effect of shell activation in the fourth seismic interpretation of a UK continental shell field. My name is Ricardo Rangel, I'm a research bioscientist, and the work that I will present was done in the Edinburgh Timeless project at the Harry Watt University. During this presentation, I will introduce some concepts behind the shell activation. I'll describe the data that was used as a case study. Then I will move to show the simulation results, the synthetic seismic modeling process and its comparison with the observed seismic uh, for the seismic. To finish, I will present some results and discuss the conclusion. The approach of this work was to include shell in a typical 4D seismic forward modeling workflow of a conventional reservoir to study the pressure diffusion related interaction between sun and the shells and its elastic implication in the 4D seismic signature. This implies the characterization and appropriate representation of shell in the static, dynamic and petroelastic models. In order to compare if the shells were active or not, we use it observer for the seismic and synthetic seismic model to establish if the interaction between sun and reservoir was creating a signal of its, of its own. The first step into the shell active workflow is to recognize the internal architecture of the shell and the heterogeneity below the petrophysical definition of cutoff. If the end member of the shell is moved to a truly pure muston, you, it's easy to see that there is a lot of heterogeneity, lamination of seal and lamination of clays within shell. And that space between the typical definition of the, of the shell and member and the truly muston line will give you a full range of heterogeneity. Those heterogeneity constitute preferential permeability path that even when it cannot allow fluid flow during the, the production lifetime, it can allow pressure diffusion. Shell characterization to estimate static and dynamic properties was done through a, a petrophysical analysis following a material balance approach where the clay fraction composition is the key. As only few conventional reservoirs acquired shell data analysis, the proportion and the presence of the different type of clay has to be done through a uh, basin analysis or clay provenance. Uh, for the permeability estimation, I use the empirical method of Yang and Appling of 2007 that is based on porosity, pressure and clay fraction proportion. The field application is a Paleocene reservoir deposited in the UK continental shelf by a libid-to-bid system. The faulty the configuration of the reservoir creates four different segments. In this work, I want to work with the segment one, which you can see in the center of the, of the slide. This field has a very narrow uh, pressure window between the bubble point and the reservoir, and for that reason was developed, developed from the beginning with water injection. That particularity makes this field very susceptible to any changes in, in, in pressure and create a gas coming out of, of solution. The data that I have available for this study was a, the simulation model with history matching production data from 1998 to 2009, 11 years, and a pre-production seismic survey with three monitors that were used to compare it and to establish the, the for the seismic signature. In this well tie, it can be appreciated the reservoir architecture that comprises three depositional sequences associated to different turbidite flows embedded in the pelagic succession. The internal seismic reflection of the reservoir are dominated by the density and the velocity spikes associated to the presence of carbonate cemented interval within the main turbidate channel phases. Reservoir shells consist of a mixture of clays dominated by the light with a minor fraction of chloride and smectite. With a salt compaction train and porosity variations between 14 and 12 percentage, uh, you can see in the cross plot 
that the difference of density and velocity between sun and shelf are not too big, so the impedance constant contrast that is going to be observed there is based on differences in the saturation. The estimated permeabilities are 28 nanodarcies for the horizontal and 7 nanodarcies for the vertical permeability. To establish a reference between the active and inactive model, I create two different scenarios, one with the, all the shells inactive as they were in the initial uh, conventional uh, simulation model, and another where all the shells from overburden, underburden, sideburden, and inter-reservoir shells were activated. To observe the effect of the transmissivity multipliers that were modeled in the initial model, I took it for, for extra scenario where I removed some of them and I let them all stay during the, the simulation to establish which is the effect of the shell in the reservoir connectivity. Here you can see the result of the saturation for the, mon for the four main scenarios. Uh, in this section, you can see on the top left the inactive shell models with transmissivity multipliers and without transmissivity multipliers. Without transmissivity multipliers, obviously the response of the saturation is a little bit more blurry, more radial, the pattern of drainage. While for the inactive, for the active shell models in the down with, with active uh, transmissivity multipliers and without them, uh, the pattern is slightly different. But in general, in some very localized area, there is less gas coming out of solution in the shell active model within the channel phases. This is basically because of the pressure drop in the reservoir was not so big as it has extra volume with the shell to equilibrate the pressure drop. But with phases that are outside of the main channel, there was some gas coming out of solution as effect of that very small pressure drop. Remember that the reservoir has a very narrow pressure window between the bubble point and the pressure of the reservoir. Looking into the production history matching, we can see the result for a, with transmissivity multipliers that clearly conditions a, how the data is matching the, the historic one. The historic one, you can see it with a, a black line in, in, in the plots. Uh, but once that you remove the transmissivity multipliers, we can see that those were modeled to force the model to converge to the, to the historic uh, production data. If the, if the model doesn't have transmissivity multipliers, we can see that, the, that those elements were compensated the effect of shell as without transmissivity multipliers, the, inact the active shell model match much better the historic data from water production for hydrocarbon production, but it's not the case for, for the gas. The volume of gas are, are better from the inactive shell models. Regarding the elastic model of, of the reservoir, this was conducting performing rock physics analysis based on petrophysical evaluation in order to define the elastic module of the different of the different lithotypes. In this case, uh, the cleanest sand and the purest uh, shell. Depending of the method uh, to represent the reservoir heterogeneity, uh, that could be according to Sagnum or or, or, or by net to gross, uh, these lithotypes, the models, were using to create a sand shell mixing to give for each shell the elastic model of, of, of the properties. Once that each shell has that, uh, for the different time steps that were simulated, uh, the, satura the saturated uh, model was calculated using Gassman substitution with the result of, of, of the saturation. Uh, with those results, uh, we're est in, the, in a sim 2 imp uh, workflow, where estimated the, the impedance and the velocities and, and the densities. And using a 1D convolutional model with a extracted wavelet, uh, those uh, data were converted into 
synthetic uh, traces and uh, extrapolated to seismic volume, synthetic seismic volume. Here we can observe the 4D seismic response. At the top we have the observed uh, 4D seismic. Uh, this response was extracted using RMS amplitude between the top of the reservoir and the base, including some intervals, some milliseconds for the overburden and the underburden also. Uh, below that, we have the inactive shell model response, and below we have the active shell models without and with a transmissivity multipliers. Uh, taking a look into the different response of, of the model of the scenarios, we can see that the strong dependence that the hardening signal has with the presence of transmissivity multipliers. Basically, this is trying to match the hardening that is occurring as a consequence of the injection of water and of the compaction that is happening as, as cause of, of, of the production. But one of the main things that we can observe is that with sh without the shells active, there is a very poor match for the softening signal. Once that the shells were activated, the softening signal that you can see as a red in the, in the maps is much better matched by the models with a shell inactive. If, and if the transmissivity multipliers are, are removed, uh, the match uh, enhances a lot. Putting more putting numbers in the results that, that we can see, here I'm showing the the match between the observed and model scenarios. Uh, in Magenta, you can see the areas where the model scenario match the, the observed data. In light blue, where there is a match with the hardening. And in white, you can see the areas where there is an absolute mismatch between the data. Uh, taking a look into the, into the numbers, we can observe that the active shell models in general, improve the, the fit to observe data with a range that, for example, for the inactive shell model without transmissivity multiplier is as high as 5%. To a better understanding of the distribution of the softening signal, we have to look back at the geology. If you take a look at, at the distribution of the net to gross in the map of the reservoir below, we can see that the distribution of the hardening is related to the main channel structures, while the softening is associated to the overbank. In the initial models where the shells were not active, those phases were isolated through the use of transmissivity multipliers. With the shell active, the permeability of the shell, even when it's very low in the, in the range of nanodarsis, allow connectivity between the main channel phases and the overbank phases. That connectivity allows pressure drop, and that pressure drop causes gas coming out of solution. And that gas coming out of solution is responsible of the softening signal in the field. To conclude, I would like to say that shell active may model volumetric and prediction more accurate. The transmissivity multipliers in this case are compensating the shell. Uh, the shell activation improves the 4D seismic interpretation in this case, is allowing us to interpret the origin of the softening, softening signal that in the models that were shell inactive cannot be possibly explained. And lastly, uh, main shell active allow a better understanding of the geological model and the reservoir connectivity, which is the case that's happening here. I would like to thank to the Edinburgh Time Last Project sponsor for sharing the data that was used in this and for support this research. Thank you for your attention. You can like and share this video. For more e-lectures, please check the EAGE e-lecture playlist.